Hello, good day everyone. In this video, I will be discussing three sets of viruses. The following are the human immunodeficiency virus, human papillomavirus, and herpes simplex virus. We will be discussing each of the viruses according to its pathophysiology, classification, morphology, and laboratory diagnosis. First, we will start with the human papilloma virus. Papilloma viridae or the human papilloma virus has 16 genera. It also has 5 infectious members which are the alpha, beta, gamma, mupa, and nupa papilloma virus. And this is also a former member of the papova viridae because it shares similar morphology of the polyoma virus. Pathophysiology, so your human papilloma virus can be transmitted through close contact conditions and this will cause infections at cutaneous and mucosal sites leading to the development of warts. So a table below here shows each of the human papilloma virus types with its clinical lesion and suspected oncogenic potential. So as you have observed, no, um, most of the types are benign, but only uh, types 5, 8, 9, etc. Uh, types are mostly benign, but can progress to malignancy. Uh, and also, your types 16, 18, 30, 31, and so on has high correlation with genital and oral carcinomas, especially cervical cancer. HPV genital infections are sexually transmitted, and this is the most common sexually transmitted disease in the United States. So it also causes cervical cancer, which is the second most frequent in women worldwide. Your HPV type 16 and 18 is associated with high cancer risk. The viral oncoproteins E6 and E7 are synthesized in a cancer tissue, and these proteins will complex with RB and P53 as target sites. And nearly all HPV infections are cleared and undetectable within 2 to 3 years. This is a graph that shows the incidence versus age in the cervical cancer progression. So at age 15, the incidence rises. So it has uh, the peak no, of the HPV infection. And throughout the years, or throughout ages, the incidence um, drops and is constant throughout 45. So, at age 30, incidence of precancer lesions rises, and then these precancer lesions will progress into cancer as years go by. This is a schematic representation of a skin wart of a person infected with human papilloma virus. So we can observe the epidermal cell differentiation pathway from the outermost part to the inner. So we have in the outermost part the stratum cordium, which is the horny layer, followed by the stratum granulosum, which is the granular layer, followed by the stratum spinosum, which is the pre uh, which contains the prickle cells, and in the innermost part we have the basal cell where we can observe the rapid mitosis. So also this can be associated uh, with the viral life cycle of the human papilloma virus. So in the outermost part, um, this contains the capsid proteins and the virus particles. In the middlemost part, um, there is replicating viral DNA and early expression of genes. And then in the innermost part, this contains viral DNA which has low copy number. For the characteristic of the human papilloma virus, so the variant is icosahedral in shape, meaning it has 20 equilateral triangular sides. It is 55 nanometers in diameter. The composition is 10% DNA and 90% protein. The genome is double-stranded DNA circular with 8 kilobase pairs and the molecular weight is 5 million. It has two structural proteins, cellular histones, condensed DNA invariant. It has no envelope, 
The replication takes place in the nucleus and for the outstanding characteristics, it can stimulate cell DNA synthesis, restricted host range and tissue tropism. It is a significant cause of human cancer, especially cervical cancer, and viral oncoproteins interact with cellular tumor suppressor proteins. For the laboratory diagnosis, we can have histopathologic or cytologic examination of cutaneous biopsy or cells. We can also have DNA probe assay, which provides identification of specific genotypes in infected epithelial cells. We have the following vaccines to protect against human papillomavirus. First, we have the Cervavix. We also have the Gardasil, which also protects HPV6 and 11, which are associated with anogenital warts. We also have Gardasil 9, which protects lower risk types and or which is associated with cervical and oral cancers. And all of these vaccines will protect against HPV 16 and 18. Next, we will discuss the human immunodeficiency virus. The human immunodeficiency virus is a member of the lentivirus genus, which is under the retroviridae family. It is derived from primate lentiviruses. This is also an etiologic agent of AIDS, and individuals remain infected for life. This is the course of infection of persons having AIDS or the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome caused by HIV. So as you can see, it will start with the primary infection and the CD4 T lymphocyte count is in its normal count or number. So as the infection progresses or as the years go by, the T lymphocyte or the T helper cells will decline or the number decreases. And then after a few weeks, the viral load or viral copies of the HIV will spike and then it will uh, decline after nine weeks or about nine weeks and then the patient will experience clinical latency meaning there will be no signs and symptoms showing so after um, six or seven years the patient will um, experience symptoms and then the viral load increases then uh, when the CD4 T lymphocyte count is in, is in its low levels, the patient will experience opportunistic diseases because the patient is now immunocompromised. Then after a few years, the patient will experience death. Pathophysiology, specifically in the CD4 T lymphocyte, the cardinal feature is the depletion of T helper inducer lymphocytes. So HIV will replicate in the lymphocytes and there will be death of uninfected T cells. So the CD4, which is expressed by T lymphocyte, is the major receptor for HIV. So in CD4 T cell dysfunction, this depletes function of human immune response, both the lymphoid and the non-lymphoid cell function. For monocytes and macrophages, so some subsets of monocytes express CD4. The CCR5 chemokine receptor is the HIV core receptor on monocytes and macrophages. So its major cell types are infected with HIV, specifically in neuropsychiatric manifestations. And these cells will serve as major reservoir for HIV in the body. In the lymphoid organs, so these organs play a central role in HIV infection. So this will affect the majority of the lymphocyte pool, which is about 2% in the peripheral blood. So in the late stage of HIV, the architecture of the lymph nodes are disrupted. In viral co-infections, the activation signals in vivo antigenic stimuli serve as cellular activators. So the active infection of mycobacterium tuberculosis increases plasma viremia. The patients are vulnerable to many types of infection. 
tuberculosis risk is 20-fold. Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, and hepatitis B virus are cofactors of AIDS. And this can also produce HIV superinfection. For the characteristics, we have the envelope, which is the outer surface of the virus. Next, we have the glycoproteins, which are protein spikes embedded in the envelope to attach CD4. We also have capsid, which is the bullet-shaped core and contains the viral RNA. We also have the enzymes, which carry out steps in the HIV life cycle. First, we have the reverse transcriptase, which is responsible for the formation of proviral DNA from the viral RNA. We also have integrase, which integrate proviral DNA to host DNA in the process transcription to translation. And lastly, we have the proteases, which promotes infectivity through modification of viral proteins. We have the main structural genes. First, we have the ENV or the envelope. This is made up of GP120 and GP41. And together, they are collectively called as GP160. Second is the GAG or the group antigen. This is found in the nucleocapsid and is codes for the genes P55, P15, P17, and P24. The antibody against P24 is the first antibody detected in the laboratory. And lastly, we have the pol or the polymerase. This is found in a core together with the HIV RNA. For the laboratory diagnosis, we have two phases. We have the screening and confirmatory. For the screening test, we have ELISA or the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And the reporting of result will be either reactive or non-reactive. So in this test, this will facilitate detection of antibodies to envelope proteins. Next, we have for confirmatory, we have Western blot and the reporting will be positive or negative. So in this test, this will um, facilitate identification of specific amino acid sequences in proteins. So for the interpretation of results, um, it will be uh, reported as negative if there are no bands present, positive if there are any two of the bands are present, so that's either GP120 or 160, GP41 or P24, and indeterminate if bands are present. The last type of virus that will be discussed is the herpes viruses. The family herpes viridae is able to establish lifelong persistent infections and undergo periodic reactivation or the Latin infection. So for the morphology, it has a double-stranded DNA genome, icosahedral capsid with envelope. So we have eight human herpes virus known. So we have herpes simplex virus type 1, herpes simplex virus type 2, varicella zoster virus, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus 6, human herpes virus 7, and the human herpes virus 8. So for the latent infection, we have HSV-1 reactivation causes mucous membrane disease. HSV-2 reactivation causes mucous membrane vesicles or aseptic meningitis. Your varicella zoster virus reactivation will cause shingles. For Epstein-Barr virus reactivation, causes asymptomatic shedding or virus in the oropharynx or as disseminated disease in immunocompromised host. For cytomegalovirus reactivation in the immunocompromised host as a pathogen in the organ such as heart, gastrointestinal tract, lung and brain, and for HH6 and HH7, reactivation is in the immunocompromised host. We will now discuss the viruses under herpes viridae. So first we have the herpes simplex type 1 and 2. So this can be transmitted through direct contact with infected secretions. For HSV1, that will be infected saliva. For HSV2, this can be transmitted sexually or 
transplacental and must encounter mucosal surfaces or broken skin. And the site of latency will be sensory nerve ganglia, dorsal root ganglion, and will last for the lifetime of the host. For the pathophysiology, the HSV grows re very rapidly and highly cytolytic. The primary infections are usually mild to symptomatic. The current infection usually less severe and less extensive. The, ex the patient will experience cold, sore, and cold blister, pain, tingling, or itching before appearance of lesions, erythematous lesions, progress to papule and vesicle in 24 hours, ulcerated and heals without scarring. This can be reactivated by physical and emotional stress, fever, trauma, and UV exposure. For herpes simplex virus type 1, this can cause gingivostomatitis, pharyngitis, herpes labialis, and conjunctivitis. For the laboratory diagnosis, we can have cell culture, enzyme immunoassay, fluorescent antibody staining, PCR, serologic testing of acute and convalescent serum, and cowdery inclusions and multinucleotide and cells on cytology. Next is the varicella zoster virus. This can be transmitted close personal contact, especially respiratory secretions. The site of latency is the dorsal root ganglion, and the disease is chickenpox or varicella and shingles or zoster in latent infection. So the varicella or chickenpox is a mild, highly contagious disease. Also, this is a childhood disease with the peak incidence of 2 to 6 years old. The route of infection is the mucosa of the upper respiratory tract or the conjunctiva. Prodrome of fever, headache, and malaise. Then this also presents skin rashes, macula, papule, vesicle, pustule, and then dries up to form a scab. The first rash appears in the trunk, then spread to the head, arms, and legs. Painless but itchy that will last for a week and are not different stages of development. The rash will last for 5 days. The complications are rare, but will progress to Rye syndrome, which is an encephalopathy, with fatty degeneration of the liver, then a septic meningitis, Guillain-Barr syndrome, which is nerve weakness or paralysis, and bacterial infection of skin lesions. This will also give lifelong immunity to varicella. Next is the zoster or shingles. This is the reactivation of varicella. 10 to 20% of adults will experience at least one zoster attack during their lifetime, usually after the age of 50. This is presented or heralded by radicular or nerve pain. Then the rash appears in a unilateral dermatomal distribution, thorax, and ophthalmic division of the central nervous system, which is the neck near the skull then travels to the eyes which are the mo most common sites. The vesicles are like that of the chicken pox and will heal in two weeks. Complications are post herpetic neuralgia which is burning, itching, tingling sensation, hyperesthesia that may last for months and is common in elderly. Contact infection are less common since the virus is absent from the upper respiratory tract. The photo on the left shows the herpes zoster in the distribution of the thoracic nerves. And on the right, uh, we can observe the herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So here, um, the rash is only unilateral or one-sided. For the laboratory diagnosis, we can have fluorescent antibody stain, cell culture, shell vial culture, PCR and chunk smear. So in chunk smear, we can observe multinucleated giant cell during the course of the infection. Next, we have the Epstein-Barr virus. So this can be transmitted close contact with infected saliva. The site of latency is the B lymphocytes. The disease is infectious mononucleosis or the casing disease. The incubation period is 30 to 50 days that will last 2 to 4 weeks. The patient will observe fever, lethargy, 
myalgia, sore throat, headache, and mild hepatitis, enlarged lymph nodes and spleen, then it could have progressive lymphoreticular disease and oral hairy leukoplakia in HIV infected patients. So this oral hairy leukoplakia is a wart-like growth in the tongue. For the laboratory diagnosis, we can have serology, then PCR, then heterophil agglutination test. So the patient will develop heterophil antibodies that agglutinate sheep RBCs. Then we have lymphocytosis with atypical lymphocytes. And for oncogenic, we can have brachycephoma, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. We can differentiate the type of heterophil antibody using the Davidson differential test. So we can say that the heterophil antibody, um, which is the infectious mononucleosis, is present in the patient sample if it is not absorbed by guinea pig kidney tissue and is absorbed by beef RBCs. For force band, it will be absorbed by guinea pig kidney tissue and not with beef RBCs. With serum sickness, it will be absorbed both by guinea pig kidney tissue and beef RBCs. Next is the cytomegalovirus. This can be transmitted by close contact with infected secretions, blood transfusions, organ transplant, and transplacental. The sites of latency are WBC, endothelial cells, cells in a variety of organs such as lung, liver, esophagus, colon, and kidney, and this will produce lifelong latent infections. For the pathophysiology, this is an asymptomatic infection and it will produce congenital disease in newborn. So there will be intrauterine growth, retardation, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, microphaly, and retinitis which leads to blindness. The mortality rate is 20% and among survivors, 5-20% to will develop late manifestation like hearing loss, ocular abnormalities, and poor intellectual performance or mental retardation. Symptomatic disease in immunocompromised host is observed, has high mortality and morbidity, and it will produce pneumonia frequent complication. This is a heterophil negative or non EBV infectious mononucleosis. And CMV will cause 8% of all infectious mononucleosis syndromes. For the laboratory diagnosis, we can have cell culture shell vial cultures, serology, CMP antigenemia, fluorescent antibody stain, and PCR. Next, we have the human herpes 6 and 7. This can be transmitted close contact via respiratory droplets. The site of latency is T lymphocytes or the CD4 cells, and the diseases are the Rosiola or the Exantin subitum or 6 disease which will have short-lasting fever and skin rash. Then, the patient will experience fever, malaise, rash, leukopenia, and interstitial pneumonitis in organ transplant patients. For the laboratory diagnosis, we can have detection of virus in peripheral blood by PCR and cell culture using lymphocytes. And lastly, we have human herpes virus 8 or the Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. The transmission is not known and less widely disseminated than other herpes. The site of latency is the viral genome found in Kaposi's tumor cells, endothelial cells, and tumor infiltrating leukocytes. The disease is Kaposi sarcoma and this can be detected through PCR or in situ hybridization.